Good evening, everyone. Today we are having with us uh, Rutul Joshi. He is associate professor at SEPT, and today he will be talking about uh, Masterclass Twenty Nine, which is Transit Oriented Cities Are the Future. To talk a brief, uh, Rutul sir teaches urban planning at SEPT University. Uh, he did his uh, recent uh, study, which was a multi-year research project on concept contextualizing transit. Uh, oriented development for indian cities and in his keen area of interest are land use uh, transit uh, transportation in integration and sustainable mo mobility in cities so sir wanted to ask you what is this tod and what is lap how can they be used in integrated development of a city plan right uh so thank you jay thank you for inviting me in practical cities it's a very impressive uh, series of master classes that you put together and i'm very happy to be here uh going to your question now transit oriented development and local area plans uh they go hand in hand in my view because tod is a planning concept it gives us an idea of how should we plan and local area plan is more of a now a statutory mechanism in gujarat and we hope that it is also adapted elsewhere uh, which would help you implement that planning concept uh, practically into the cities so that is what they are and what i have for you today is what i'm going to do in my talk is i'm going to talk about first of all start by two propositions okay and then follow it follow it up with seven principles uh and it's a very complicated subject to talk about land use and transport both together uh but i'm going to sort of try and do this with as much visual aids as possible and try and simplify some of these complicated uh issues as much as possible so let me straight go to the presentation so i truly believe that transit oriented cities are the future uh whether we want to accept it today or we accept it after some time uh we are going to come around here and we are going to we need to make our cities around transit uh currently government of india in last decade or so has put in uh thousands of crores of rupees in building mass transit and it is high time that we we make sure that we start orienting our cities towards that public transit and they have spent some 75000 crore to say the least and if that amount of investment is taking place in our cities then we have to uh, adapt to the idea of tod we need to reform our urban planning system in such a way that we integrate land use and transport together in form of transit oriented development along the metro corridor and like i said what i'm going to do is uh, why first give two proposition so the first proposition is transit oriented cities are the future why am i saying that uh, i am not saying that it is the future in the sense that i am predicting the future but it's actually i'm saying that the transit oriented cities should be the future and we will need to really work hard change our system reform our practices and bring in the ideas of tod in our cities and like i was saying in the beginning whether we do it now or after 5 years or 10 years i am very certain that this is the place where we need to go okay so why am i saying that because for a very long period of time if you look at wall city of ahmedabad or wall city of anywhere in india you will find that our cities have been dominated by uh, you know walking and uh, cart pulling and horse carts and bullock carts etc okay that was the first kind of cities that we made for a very long period of time uh, we are more familiar with this kind of city and uh, many many places in the west what they have also done is to sort of expand that historical city by adding tramways uh, buggies etc you can see very large footpaths here uh, and adapt to that historical core city into a, a a city which will at accommodate the modern needs but then what happens is then we have automobiles coming in in the early part of 20th century and with that comes we developed transport engineering and a science 
when we said that, well, uh, people need to travel at reasonably fast speed. And if you really want to, and then the whole science was about designing a city around that assumption that if everybody gets to travel at a certain speed, uh, we need to design a city like that because the city is all about speed. The modern city was all about speed, uh, accommodating vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the kind of planning system we put in place, uh, what is called predict and provide. So you predict that so many vehicles have to travel at this speed and we must provide infrastructure, roadways, uh, et cetera, to make sure that that happens. And there are parts of the world where people have built cities around that kind of assumption. So this is what two professors, Peter Newman and Jeff Kenworthy, calls the automobile dependent city. And a lot of the North American cities and some of the European cities as well, or some parts of the European cities fall into that category that you have a city center, which is a bit of a high density central business district. And then as you move away from it, you move into a low density suburb, okay? And that needs to be supported by this kind of transport infrastructure. And the reason I was saying that, you know, people take that 50 kilometers per hour very, very seriously, because then you need to put in place an infrastructure every junction needs to be jumped over the other so that you don't stop at the junction and waste time uh, uh, waiting at the junction. And that's why you expand the capacity of roads so much that as more and more vehicles are included, you can still retain that kind of speed. Okay, many of the American cities, uh, US cities are those kind of cities where they have put extensive road infrastructure up to 1500 kilometers of urban highways. Uh, this is a picture from uh, Texas, Houston. You can see the CBD there. You can see the uh, infrastructure, uh, road infrastructure. And here, mind you that 72% of people work, uh, go to work alone uh, in a car, right? And so this is a system that we have. So you have a CBD, you have a road infrastructure which supported, and then finally it is supported by very, very low density, suburban lifestyle, which is an American dream, okay? So that is one system that we created in uh, by the middle of 20th century. And here, if you see, uh, this is a sort of, we'll give you an idea about what the, the city would look like. So you can see that there are shopping malls on both sides, ample amount of parking, which is given. What is difficult to find is to locate a human being who is trying to cross the road. And you can see that it's very difficult to cross that road because vehicles are moving at a very high speed. So we designed the entire infrastructure, urban spaces in such a way that it accommodate cars, okay? And not really the human being because when vehicles are moving fast enough, they would be detrimental to human beings. Apart from that, they would also create congestion, there'll be air pollution, road fatalities, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and what we do in India is we often take cues from it. And if we can't retrofit our entire city, we try and make parts of the city, which, which uh, you know, sort of uh, gets those ideas from the American cities. Like Gurgaon is one such example. And here again, if you see uh, on, uh, on a road in Gurgaon, you will find that, well, there is ample space for vehicles to move in. And now you can imagine that if I want to go on the left-hand side of the road to the right-hand side of the road, tell me how will you cross that road? You know, simple things like this. So while we are trying to make uh, mobility possible for certain kind of vehicles, we are curtailing mobility of the other kind. And what happens in Indian cities, our cities are very different cities, right? I mean, look at these people trying to cross the roads. It almost becomes difficult. I've seen in Ahmedabad an elderly lady calling, telling an auto rickshaw driver uh, that, you know, can you drop me on the other side of the road? Because she was too scared to go across the road, right? So urban highways have a lot of utilities, but urban highways also uh, divide the city in two parts. This is something that we need to remember when we plan our cities. What urban highways also do that they create unsafe environment on the street because a lot of the modern cities are planned with an assumption that we have introvert looking, inward looking neighborhood, 
and then the street edges are either have green strip or or you know some sort of a green belt or simply the high compound walls of the of the adjoining neighborhood which creates also very unsafe environment uh, in in our cities whereas our traditional cities are being very very different right we have what we call uh, niche dukan upar makan kind of situation is repeated everywhere uh, it's also you see actually that kind of situation mix land use kind of situation also into some of our newer cities as well right uh, these cities were not really designed to accommodate vehicles they were designed to accommodate life and people okay uh, we also have many heritage structures uh, so the point is that when we have cities like this to what extent can we go on to design cities which would accommodate more and more vehicles and when where do we stop okay we know that road fatalities we have very severe number coming out from indian cities uh, air pollution most of our cities are struggling with right uh, and traffic congestion i don't need to tell you much about it uh, more and more people are buying new vehicles every day and we need to really decide that how long will this go on if you look at the data of the some hard data of the vehicular purchase in india you will find that for about 60 years in india we have bought about 10 crores vehicle after independence and just in last 7 to 8 years we have bought another 10 crore vehicles okay in next 5 years what this graph doesn't show are the projections in next 5 years we are going to add another 10 crore vehicles probably it might have slowed down due to pandemic but that is going to happen uh, and then by 2040 we can make projections so and so forth the question is how are we going to accommodate all these vehicles in our existing cities okay and that's why it's very important that we build and and develop public transport system in our cities and expand their capacity so that more and more people start using them and rather than keep on going on the route of uh, buying more vehicles and make that as a main uh, commute vehicle now i would also say that in india vehicles are a status symbol they are not going to go away easily so what we need to do is maybe you can buy vehicles okay but then try and share those vehicles as much as possible not like us where 72% of population drive alone to work uh we need to put in place a system of car pooling maybe uber ola etc that is going to change the system but at the same time the people who are currently driving two wheelers people who do not own any vehicle which is a large number in india unlike in us where uh, for every four person there are three cars in india that number is pretty low right now if all indians become prosperous and start buying cars our city we won't be able to move around in our cities and that's why we need to reimagine our cities very very differently in next 20 years what we need to do is develop networks of public transit and try and make sure that people who want to use public transit try and stay close to uh, the transit station as much as possible or at least on the transit corridors okay so there are different ways of looking at this that we develop various networks and then uh, develop nodes or corridors where people who want to use public transit can stay uh, people who do not want to use public transit ideally should stay away from the public transit line uh, i imagine that those people will be rich people with many cars and they can very well go and live in suburbs but in the core city area we have to imagine them very very differently okay another point i would like to make here is that each node is very very different you know that ghatkopar is different than dadar right in amdavad ghatlodia is different uh, than ashram road so each node needs to be planned depending upon its local strength so when we say tod we forget one thing that we need to bring in and and add to the local flavor rather than doing homogeneous development across all the nodes okay tod that's why does not mean that you make give high fsi and forget about it 
what we really need to do is what is the local planning brief that you can develop for each node, uh, which is uniquely sort of supports the local activities and strengthen uh, each node like that. Right. So we can think of various models where uh, you know you can have mixed housing, you can have commercial development, you have outright uh, sort of institutional area. Uh, which required the movement of students, etc. So there could be many kind of TODs possible, but the people who the want to use transit should stay close to it. Okay, and we have to make it possible for them to stay close to it through our planning. And once they start staying close to those transit zone, what we need to support that transit zone is ideally uh, what we are lacking in our cities in terms of last mile connectivity. That you know walking, maybe cycling. Maybe even auto rickshaws in Delhi, there are a lot of cycle rickshaws, various ways by which you should be able to reach to the transit station very, very comfortably. And the transit station should also merge into its environment. Uh, it could also have amongst the high density, it could still have some open spaces. Uh, so it doesn't mean that we, when we create high density nodes, doesn't mean that we don't have a large public realm. And that is a point which I'll make in detail uh, in the next part. But here is a very curious graphic which I wanted to show as part of this masterclass. This is, these are the maps which come from London. And you can see the ownership of vehicle versus where one chooses to live. If you don't own any vehicle, it is possible for you to live in the central or you know intermediate kind of area of the city. Once you start buying more than one two, three, four cars, uh, which requires a lot of parking space, okay, you would actually would like to stay in the periphery of the city. And let me tell you that this map of London, which is which comes from 2018 or 19, is not an accident. It is something years of policy, last two development plan, especially 2012 development plan, imagine the city where people who want to live close to the transit station would not be given enough parking because they don't need to consume parking whereas if you want to have a house with three or four car parks you can only afford to make it in the outer periphery of the city it is a system which has been designed and i think that's what we need to sort of start moving towards slowly and steadily over next couple of decades now how do we do that because we are talking about practicalities of cities it becomes important that what I talked about as a TOD idea does not remain in the air. And we have a mechanism by which we can do that. Okay. So what is going to be that systematic redevelopment mechanism? And this reminds me of a very good cartoon from Levardist that, uh, you know, rebuilding an existing city would require imagination. And that's what we need to do. Uh, this is another very interesting graphic come from New York. Every city around the world in the last 200 years have made sure that there is a systematic redevelopment which has taken place. The cities which have been able to recycle their land and do this kind of systematic redevelopment have been more successful. Otherwise, there are many cities in India which has very thriving economy, but then people start living away from the city center and try and develop periphery, which is happening in Bangalore, which is happening in Delhi, which is happening uh, in Pune. And it is also beginning to start happening in Ahmedabad. That rather than reviving our city center and start recycling land in the uh, systematic way, we try and develop pockets in the periphery. Okay, And what I'm saying in further to that is we need to develop pockets around transit, not only in the city center. Now, there's a very interesting graphic which comes from HCP uh, uh, DPM, where they've done simple study of the use of ground in Indian cities. And they find that we are very poor at utilizing the ground in our cities. Okay, Our road networks are not complete. They are inadequate. They are incompleted. They are, they are developed in ad hoc manner. So like, for example, in Bangalore, what, you, what they do is acquire a piece of land do a plant colony there. So many Indian cities become, uh, the planning doesn't work in Indian cities because they become sort of uh, ad hocly developed plant colonies. And in between those plant colonies, like if you see in Mumbai, you have slums. 
Okay, so the city is sort of a patchwork of planned areas, rather than plan planning happening systematically and that re land recycling happening systematically. What is also problematic is the way in which our build building regulations are uh, designed. Because we want to have margins and setbacks, etc., for every plot, and we have a no mechanism of sharing that those margins and setback with the adjoining plot. What happens is we create an island and then put a building in the in between, right? And that practically those two or three meters or sometimes four or five meters of space is practically wasted because sometimes you cannot use it for a larger purpose. Okay, which which is a very poor use of land. I mean, many of you might be engineer who will be able to make a quick calculation that when you have forty percent ground use on every plot. How much of that remaining 60% you will be able to utilize? And the answer is generally only 30%. Rest of the 30% is just wasted uh, in creating that kind of a perimeter. Okay. So we need to reimagine some of those regulations as well when we do this. So the question is how do we reimagine a living city? How do we do planning in the brownfield situation? And this is something. In India, we have not really taken very, very seriously. Okay, and that's where comes the idea of local area plan. That we are, what we are proposing is that you do redevelopment. And what happens in case of town planning scheme in Gujarat and elsewhere is that you give some land in the common pool to make common infrastructure, common amenities, etc. Here, in case of local area plan. What happens is you give some part of your land and the common pool to build infrastructure, public spaces, etc. And in lieu of that, you get more floor space. So the idea is that you don't give random higher FSI to everybody. Okay. You give higher FSI to people who want to contribute to the public space. Okay. And at the same time, are ready to redevelop their land. Okay, and not sit on it for a very long period of time. So this kind of more market responsive mechanism that you get something in return, and that's where you get the incentive. Okay, it's, the incentive is not given to anybody and everybody, and maybe you give higher F, uh, FSI as well. So in that sense, what we need to imagine our build, uh, our regulations as development promotion regulation rather than control regulation, and that means that our conventional uh, plan planners will have to get out of control mindset into more of a promotion and more positive uh, mind frame uh, to do this. So see, another problem that we have in our city is moment of public transit investments are made. Now, many of you will know that there's a very, very expensive infrastructure that we are building. We are building in tune of 200 crores to about 400 crores is the per kilometer cost of a metro construction, depending upon the kind of corridors you have, right? If you're making it underground, then it's very expensive. If you're making it above ground, then it's slightly cheaper, but it's still very expensive. When you are investing so much of money uh, in our cities, we are making 700 kilometers of transit line currently uh, in India. Won't you spend about 20 crores not 200 crores, just 20 crores in developing the area around this infrastructure that you are creating. And that is what needs to happen because right now you can see, visually see that the transit is not talking to the development on the side. Okay, they are oblivious, oblivious to it. And we think that by inserting a transit like this in our cities, we'll be able to transform. And that is where this local area plan comes into the picture that even if you just give 20 crores as a seed capital to each local area plan through FSI sale, etc., they might be able to give you better returns. Okay, if you can start making that uh, transaction happen. But at the same time, I want to sort of explain this with a very simple graphic that you know, uh, the people are not very happy in many of the uh, situation in our cities. You insert a transit situation remains the same. It's only when you start investing in that area and start making it better. That's where the life will become better for people in the city. And that's where we need to sort of differentiate between TOD and TAD, which is transit adjacent development 
any random development which happens around transit, uh, which is just piling up floor space next to the transit. Whereas what we need to do is to make compact development, which is mixed use, walkable neighborhoods, uh, and development which is co conducive to more transit use. That's where our transit systems in India, which are right now struggling with ridership, will also get more riders in future. Okay. Now, a lot of people are worried is that when you give higher FSR, won't it create congestion? Okay. And what we want to sort of tackle this as well, to say that, well, when you create, give higher FSI randomly, it may create congestion because it's not planned FSI. But when you say that, well, after giving higher FSI, we are going to increase the area under public realm and street. We are going to complete the network of streets. We may target low crowding of vehicles around transit stations, but high, how high crowding of people. Now in Mumbai, in a very organic and unorganized way, this happens. You don't want to take your vehicles to near the railway station in Mumbai because it's going to be full of people. Okay, that's what we need in a positive, in a more or well organized way. If you design streets and buildings in such a way uh, that they support walkability in the local area. And then with that and the amount of money which you get from the sale of FSI, etc., you upgrade the infrastructure. Okay, so what you do in TOD is now I come to those seven principles very, very quickly. And this is based on the handbook that me and my some of my wonderful colleagues have worked on, uh, which is available online and you can download it and read it. Uh, it is precisely for this purpose of making the idea of TOD popular. And in that book, we talk about a lot of things, but I've just extracted about seven principles out of it. And let me sort of detail out what do we mean by how do we go about doing TOD planning? Uh, in our cities. Okay, so first one, we have to, when we do a local area plan in the transit zone, our first and foremost responsibility is to make sure that there is a good, clean network of streets. Okay, this is a job that nobody will do. Uh, you know, tomorrow you might be able to fix the streets by better design or have better parking management in the area or make a new garden. But this is something which can only happen while you're planning, replanning an area. Okay. So how do you convert that incomplete street into complete street? This is where our mechanism of giving the floor space in lieu of land comes into the picture. So you say that, well, this is a real life case of Yashwanpur in Bangalore. You can see that there is a railway line uh, along with that, you have a metro corridor. There are large uh, chunk of land. Some of that is industrial land ready to be redeveloped. Well, when they come for redevelopment, you have to tell them that, okay, you have to give maybe 10, 15, 20% of the area back in the pub public realm. We'll make public roads out of it and give your plot of land more accessibility. Okay, we are not taking away your 15, 20% land somewhere else. We are going to make more and more number of plots in your own property more accessible with that land. And in lieu of that, we will give you higher floor space. Okay, so you give higher floor space based on certain conditionality like this. And what you aim to develop, and there's a wonderful work that IRSDC uh, is doing, and it is from their planning handbook, is to see that, well, Traditionally, we think railway station or a metro station is something which divides the city. It becomes a public place, ideally, now, where it connects the city, different parts of the city, maybe a heritage part and a garden and a central business district, etc. So we have to see metro infrastructure not as a standalone infrastructure that we are inserting in the city, but something which connects the city. Uh, and that's why the kind of static rectangular boxes of uh, station design that we do, we need to also reimagine them. And you might be able to give direct access from station to the adjoining building. Okay, and your local area plan can pay for that infrastructure. And actually, if you allow this kind of public access, that should not be calculated in your uh, calculation of your FSI. 
integrate buses uh, with the transit station, give them space. Uh, many times what happens is our metro station think that they have a monopoly over corridor, but when they think it from the customer's point of view, somebody might be coming through a bus. So you must allow buses to come inside your premises, share platform with them, have common ticketing, uh, have common information sharing between two uh, modes of transport. That's where it becomes more integrated transport. And that's where the transit station design itself play a very, very important role. The second thing is design of street, expand the public realm. That is where you will not feel that you are in a, you might have gone to a, a sort of a cities abroad where they have very tall buildings. Whenever you have tall buildings, please notice that they also have an expanded public realm. Okay, that's where it, you don't feel the congestion on the street. And what we end up doing at times is our definition of public realm remains along the transit station sometimes. You know that they only, uh, the metro lines only end up paving the roads below the transit station. Actually, what they need to do is do and do an intervention at an area level, not only at a corridor level. Okay, not only paving the street, but actually design the streets in such a way uh, that you have ample open spaces and also we need to recognize that there are different users of our streets. So there is vending, please organize it, give them space, you know, demarcate a boundary that you can only use so much. Give a clear corridor for walking. You know, we'll also have trees, uh, a bit of a furniture zone. We need to accommodate. So every street is a design exercise where you need to accommodate all of these things and make sure that there is space for walking and park vehicles and moving vehicles. Okay, so it's it's really we need to imagine our streets not as a template of design, but something that you design based on local conditions. Now buildings also have a huge role to play in the way in which the streets play out. And we don't learn this here now in 21st century, we learn from Jaipur old city from 17th century which tells us that the buildings needs to be street oriented when there are commercial streets, when there are busy streets, when there are dynamic streets, when there are mixed land use areas, you can actually design buildings in such a way that they are built to the edge, right? The pedestrian access the building from the front, the cars can access the building from the back. Those kind of situations are always possible. And that's where, you know, the commercial value will also go, uh, go up in such areas. Okay, and we have to get rid of compound walls. Actually, uh, ORDA in Ahmedabad is doing some wonderful work in making sure that the buildings, uh, the front edges of the building remains active. Okay, they are doing that in entire new development, uh, uh, which is happening everywhere in Ahmedabad. Right, so I think we need to imagine streets as this. And once you have this kind of active front edges, the eyes on the street will follow. Okay, those streets become safe uh, by design. Now, one more thing that we need to do while planning the TOD in India, and that is creating the supply of affordable housing near the transit station. If you see the scenario in many of the Indian cities is that poor people have can make only two choices. One is that you live in shabby condition in the closer to the city center, almost in a slum-like condition, or you go and live in tiny houses on the periphery and then suffer the long commute through a very bad public transport service. Okay, uh, when we actually make investment in public transit, public transit need ridership. And on the other side, we have a lot of people who actually need to access the city. Right now, the system that we are creating is that we have public transit, but no riders. And then there are riders who are living on the periphery who are not very well connected with the city would end up investing in a motorized two wheelers. So we need to bring riders close to the transit. And that is the kind of idea that you only need to do. And that is where we can actually use the funds from PMAY because PMAY is the largest program right now. Uh, of government of India, which is investing heavily in the housing sector. Okay, they have invested some 20, 22,000 crore uh, in housing or promised to uh, invest. 
Similarly, if you are spending 75,000 crore for metros, why can't these two programs can talk to each other? Because metro read ridership and wherever you are making PMI by housing, as you can imagine, cheap land will be available on the periphery. So you will end up making housing for the poor on the periphery. They will need transport. They will need access to the city. And we need to actually combine these two things uh, more efficiently. That you can have affordable housing being built next to the transit line and not really away from it. If some developers want to build affordable housing in the TOD zone, they need to be incentivized. Now, let's come to parking. And that's where, uh, I mean, I can talk for an hour on parking and the parking economics. But let me stop at one simple thing that we do in our cities, uh, in our conventional parking policy. Uh, there is a lot of congestion on the street. And we think that if we give more space in the buildings next to the streets, we'll be able to solve this problem. Okay, that's how our convention planners have been thinking about it. Now, I would like you to think of these two things, parking on the street and parking in the building as two different kinds of products. If product one uh, is the parking on the street, product two is parking in the buildings. Now, if you look at simple basic economics of demand and supply, in order to solve the demand problem of product one, you are supplying product two. Okay. And you think that higher supply of product two will solve the problem of demand management of product one. And that's the reason why this simple thing is not working. Okay. It's not that, that people don't want to go and park inside the buildings. They have no incentive to do so. Right. If I'm, if I'm distributing streets for free on the street, uh, on the street, why would I go and buy an expensive suite from inside the building? It does not make common sense. That's why the parking in our cities is in shambles. It just doesn't work. We have a lot of empty parking inside the malls, inside the buildings, whereas the streets outside are crowded with vehicles. It's only when we start doing demand management by pricing the product one properly, treat uh, every parking as real estate, which means if you price your own seat parking higher than uh, you know parking inside the building, that is where people will have incentive to move inside. And that's why, uh, and that is what we need to do even more so in the TOD area. Because here you are saying that more commuters should live in the TOD area, which means that you will actually give less supply of parking. If somebody wants to buy two or three cars, they, they should not be actually living in the TOD area. That's why the parking requirement in the TOD area should be different than the parking requirement elsewhere in the city, right? Uh, there is a lot of stuff about bundling, unbundling parking. I'll not go into that at the moment. Uh, but I think I'm also making a case of making more flexible and market responsive zoning regulations. Okay, you should be able to make different kind of products of buildings uh, through your regulation, rather than you know a stereotypical buildings that our regulations end up creating. And that's why what we need to do is maybe a flexible FSI, flexible land use, a broad zoning. Uh, only the non-compliant use should be sort of listed an efficient use of public land. I mean, there's one study done uh, by EPC in Ahmedabad that actually uh, there's a lot of public land available with various government agency never consolidated together. I mean, something in tune of some uh, 44,000 crore or something, right? And that is something that is we need to really work on. And we have to now stop giving a lot of reservations on land, right? So there is a huge agenda, reform agenda of, of uh, reforming the our current urban planning practice. And LAP is a good mechanism through which we can do it. And lastly, in India, moment we talk about POD, a uh, lot of people get excited about land value capture. Uh, and I would only like to say that, well, in order to create, in order to capture value, you sometimes have to create value first. And the only way to create value is by investing in public land. 
you know uh, you know that you know somewhere you have white footpaths somewhere where uh, you know government is invested money in some good infrastructure suddenly property prices in adjoining areas go higher up okay so that initiative has to be taken by the government of investing in an area that's where the prices go up when the prices go up you can try and capture the value through various mechanisms okay so that is one principle that we have to remember and remember this graphic that finally you can only uh, invest what what happens in india unfortunately is government put lot of restriction in private run uh, and no attention paid to public run we need to reverse the scenario what i am trying to propagate is that you need to work in private run with soft hand and make investment in public run which is the prime function of the government right so if you really want to implement transit oriented development very well in indian cities uh, we'll have to follow these seven principles uh, but mind you that not only the seven principles we have to work with lot of common sense good planning is lots and lots of common sense okay it's it's very different in my view from architecture where architects say that i want to do this and i want to do this and i want to give you this experience planning is all about saying that okay what works uh in the city and if everybody is doing this then there must be a reason for it and our job as a planner is to find out what those reasons are and make it, make systems which accommodate people okay it's a very different approach it's an accommodative approach uh, than outright design approach we have to forget everything what we want to do in the city we want to we want to do what people want okay and i think if we go with that approach use common sense study the existing patterns study the existing use and activities we might be able to make better plan in our cities uh, and with that well i would like to end thank you very much thank you sir thank you so sir uh, it was uh, really interesting to know about like uh, what you started with the predictive and pro uh, and to provide then you also talked about uh, the london case study then you talked about systematic planning how can pod and lap link to the lmc last mile collectivity and uh, uh, there were also lots of interesting things that you showed about the seven principles and uh, from how can we move from tad to tod transit adaptive and development to transit oriented development so uh, i just have uh, two questions and would like audience if they have any question they can comment in the uh, section below uh, sir first question is are there any policies and guidelines Uh, which are related to pod or uh, lap uh, subset of this question is should there be or not or and should there be a separate one or should there be a amended in some bylaws or some other right so uh, thankfully in india we have a national pod policy uh, came out in 2017 it's available uh, on the ministry's website it's a very comprehensive policy it's a good policy uh, and actually the seven principles also rely heavily on uh, those principles uh, discussed in the national policy uh, we also have a statutory mechanism in gujarat so we have made an amendment in our gujarat town planning and urban development act and the section 76a now accommodates the idea of local area plan so Uh, gujarat cities at least are supposed to make local area plans and in western part of ahmedabad and some in east i think in ahmedabad they made about 15 local area plans uh, and they are at the draft stage uh, we are waiting for further guidance and approval from the state government so there have been lot of work which has happened uh, in in this it's just that i think we need to channelize our energies and make sure that lot of these things see the implementation in our cities we might have policies in place we might have plans in place uh, but the implementation is uh, uh, is is the sort of a last mile that we really need to where we have to walk the talk and that has to happen and that has to happen only way by which if government decide 
that I'm going to invest 50 crore plus for every local area plan that is being made. And then tomorrow I'll earn that 50 crore and more out of the FSI sale, which happens through that local area plan. So then actually you can make very marketable plans. I completely agree with you, sir. Uh, so but coming to the next part of the question was uh, talking very practically, say, for example, uh, you know you are an expert in POD and uh, LAP. You have know about each in-depth principle of seven, the seven principle in-depth. If you are made a commissioner or mayor of a city, uh, in terms of you can tell Mumbai, what are different cities? But if you are made a mayor or commissioner of a city, how will you execute this seven principle on board? There will be challenges. There, so developing in terms of LAP local area plan, there will be challenges. How would you have to execute this? So I think I would uh, see because commissioners are always or mayors are always firefighting. Okay, they don't have time for long, making long-term plan. Is one is that I will strengthen the planning department so that they can make long-term plan for next five years, ten years, etc., uh, and give a mandate that well start making local area plan along the uh, the metro corridor uh, everywhere in the city. But at the same time, there are certain things which you can which you could have done yesterday, and you can't wait for planning to happen. Okay, so I don't think that planning can solve all problems. What we can definitely start doing in most of the areas where public transit is in good supply or are coming, slowly, slowly start developing culture of, of that kind of TOD-ness in those areas. So maybe make decent, if not too wide, three to four feet wide footpath, which are walkable. Okay, uh, it does not cost much. In about 70 crore rupees, you can make like kilometers of footpaths. And then in the areas where you have a high demand, well, start putting in place a pricing mechanism so that people have start a habit of start paying for parking. Okay, uh, so which we have uh, happening in like areas like CG Road and elsewhere, uh, but that can be expanded. People should understand that well. If I'm going in an area where there is a high demand of parking, I either go with smaller vehicle uh, or I should be able to ready to pay and, and make that payment very easy. A lot of the time, uh, the resistance to payment comes because it is so cumbersome. You know, so if you can do app-based payment, some, uh, some tags which you can scan and very quickly pay, stuff like that, uh, then I don't think that people mind paying. It's just that you have to get them into that habit. So only organizing parking and making decent footpath can actually start changing the area. Quite a bit. I mean, you can see the new footpaths which are designed on CG Road would actually now encourage the buildings to make some investment and renovate those buildings. Okay, so that's a that's a win-win that we create, and that is something that you could have done yesterday. I mean, uh, I don't have to wait for a five-year plan to to do some of those things. Yes, I completely agree, uh, and. Uh, I hope all the viewers who uh, viewed this masterclass, they got to know at least what is TOD LAP. And now if they want to have this concept clear in mind, they can use this concept in future also, and they can uh, create LAPs and TODs in future. So uh, thank you, sir, for uh, this wonderful masterclass. And it was really good learning for us and all the viewers. So, thank, you, sir. thank you so much, Jay. Thank you, you and your team.